Fragility. Fragility. Yeah, yeah, DeFranco. Yeah. It's a yeah, yeah. It's a really good, good for that introspective, deep work. Um, you know, what's uh, there's. We talked about society and culture. Absolutely. I mean, that takes us right to. There's a good. There's a very different um, uh, tone to this one, but another really kind of fun one for for that kind of like introspection is uh, this comedian, Amber Ruffin. She and her sister are both black women, and they wrote this book together called uh, You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey. And it's just anecdotes about Lacey as the sister, and she, she spent her career in um, Omaha uh, in the HR space. And it's just anecdotes about um, the two sisters and things, things that they have experienced, so like crazy stuff that white people have said to them, were like crazy, like really, some very hard, like meaty, difficult stories, but a lot of really just like, oh my gosh, like it's so it's so bad, it's funny kind of stories, and they are hilarious. Amber Ruffin's a comedian, and so she she has a gift for storytelling in a way. So it's like you're cracking up, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible, and you're learning all at the same time, <laughs> and it's like it's really it's really good. She writes for, is it Seth Meyers? Yeah, she does. She writes yeah. a little bit of weight, I guess. And then she has her own show, too, on Peacock. Yeah. She's, she's great. She's really great. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, when she. Um, I never believe what happened. Yeah, and Amber Ruffin is one of the. Amber Ruffin and Lacey, I don't remember her last name, but they're co authors of that. I don't know if you can Yeah, when she kind of. You know, she is a gifted comedian, but when she sort of takes off her comedian hat, and yeah, she, she, I, she did she Chance of Fires where she just talked directly to the camera about her experiences that she had, and uh, it was moving, you know, it was them and me. You know, one, I mean, again later, one of the thoughts that came to mind at the Q&A in the last session was, uh, I think it was year that you asked about, you know, is it easier to do this when you're 20 or when you're 6? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a tennis partner who was uh, evangelical and Christian, mm -hmm. and we were able to have some conversations, but when I got, I got to the point where I could ask him, well, what, what's at stake for yeah. you? Yeah. 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 And Everything. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, he yeah. has I put know. everything into this yeah, belief system. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's like if you do yeah. anything to challenge it, the whole thing comes uh, right. down. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, it's like getting. Mm -hmm. it's, I think a lot of this comes down to noticing mm -hmm. where, where is the space where growth is even possible? You know, or where challenge is possible? So it's like if it's a lot more. If the truth is that, you know, you're talking about knocking out somebody's entire foundation, like, of course they're going to resist that, and that's not, probably not going to be a possible conversation for them to have. But it's like finding, okay, well, what is possible now? Like, and <laughs> again with the dog training, this comes to, uh, they call this changing criteria, lowering criteria. So if the uh, dog cannot get up and jump through a hoop, um, okay, well, uh, if I hold the hoop here, Okay, well, what if I put the hoop on the ground? Can the dog walk through it? Okay, the dog can't do that. Can the dog sniff the hoop? Can the dog look at the hoop? You know, and you find you lower criteria to the point where you're like, okay, well, this is possible. We can work with this yeah. in this space. Success through lowered expectations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then you also have something to build off of. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's so many. There's so many life lessons in the dog training. I hope nobody thinks that I'm like comparing people to dogs in an offensive way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just like, we, we probably share a lot of the same evolutionary oh, absolutely. steps, right? Yeah, and, and so many of these principles are true regardless of species. Like my, I mentioned my um, animal training hero earlier, and she applies these same principles to hermit crabs and to fish, goldfish. Like she, she is incredibly gifted with like. Almost irregardless of species, you know, um, which is kind of fun. Um, well, I think I'm gonna uh, close one of the doors because sure. remember I we, closed we, one already. Oh, you did already. Right. Okay, good. We, there was a lot of noise. So, okay. what do we think? Do we want to dive in, or do we want to give another? I, dive I think go ahead and go. All right, we've got a good first here to start with. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I want to start off by telling a story. Uh, from my 
time at Dallas Baptist University, which is the third picture there, all the way on the right, um, where I started my undergrad. I, um, I went there for three years, and I was in the philosophy program, and one of the friends that I made in that program was this really charming guy. Um, very tall, a little bit awkward, but, um, but just like sparkling personality. Extremely smart. His, apparently his IQ was like talked of. <laughs> you know, when he wasn't present, he probably enjoyed that. Um, but yeah, like I had a crush on him. He was a, he was a cool guy. Uh, he ended up getting married to a, a friend of mine who's still a really good friend of mine. Um, the thing about this guy is that he had a static mindset. So I don't know if you've heard this term, static mindset, dynamic mindset, where you are either sort of uh, willing to change, open to change, or not open to change. So the way this, this worked for this guy was that he believed deep down that any criticism was essentially an attack on him. Uh, because he didn't believe in the possibility of change. He didn't believe, to, to him, the, the idea of change was a very threatening idea. Because if you want me to change, you must not love me. If you want me to change, you must, like, uh, you're trying to say that I'm bad the way that I am, right? It was like an accusation almost in, in his emotional landscape. Um, and the problem is that if you live that way, um, you know, there's, you're, you're not going to be living a really healthy life, right? Like for this guy, it, it ended up destroying his marriage that he was really unwilling to, yeah. um, to, to consider changing, to, to grow or change. And um, to me, this story has kind of become a parable about fixed mindset and flexible mindset. And it's also become a parable about having ears to hear. Um, I said earlier in the announcement that as humans, we all make mistakes. As Christians, we strive to do good. We want to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. <laughs> um, we want to. Uh, we we want to. We want. We want to make a positive impact on the world. We want to live following Christ's example. Um, and these are part of our just values and, and commitments as Christians, right? Um, and also, as a community, we have the opportunity to be iron sharpening iron, always growing, always getting better. Um, which is why it's so easy, right? <laughs> um, we all agree with all three of those statements, and so problem solved. Yeah. Um, the, the truth is that, like I said earlier, getting sharpened can hurt. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, not always, it's not always fun. Um, so the person here in the lower right corner <laughs> Um, is a psychologist whose name is, I hope I say this right, Lauren Esprise Winkler. I'm just going to call her Lauren. I'm going to refer to her a couple of times in her research through this presentation. Um, she's the assistant professor in management and organizations at Northwestern Kellogg University, so quite a mouthful. And she's done a lot of work in this space about what the sort of defenses that we put up when we are, are uh, confronted with failure or learning opportunities and what it takes to get past those. Um, and the research that she's done is clear. It doesn't matter how important the information is, people will go out of their way to avoid hearing bad news. So, you know, it, it, it's like, it, you know, it could be something where it's like, oh, if you get a cancer screening, you might actually be able to completely resolve that cancer and never have it again if you catch it early, you know, like these kinds of experiences, and people are like, no, I don't want to get the screening, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> you know, like HIV, other, other diseases where it's like early intervention could really help you. In fact, it could be a matter of literal life and death. And they'll go out of their way, um, you know, to, to avoid that. Um, even when they desperately need the information. Now, why is that? It's because we want to be, we want to think highly of ourselves. We want to believe that we're competent, good. Um, capable people, we want to believe that we're the good guys, right? And when you have evidence of failure, when you have negative feedback or bad news, it's easy to interpret that as a reflection on yourself. It's easy for that to kind of bruise your, your ego or bruise your self-esteem in a, in a serious way and create these feelings of dismay and shame. Um, so what do we do? We work hard on performance. We work hard on, um, you know, 
looking like we've got it right. And sometimes we miss those opportunities when we, we fail to make the distinction about like when is this a learning moment and when is this a performance moment. Um, you know, there are performance moments at time. We, we sometimes do need to put on a good show from time to time, but we also, there are these moments where we really need to learn. Whoops. And, um, Time's out, we need to help. <laughs> it, just, it just has to blink subtle, sometimes, subtle rest its eyes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are these times when we fail to, to understand um, when, when that moment is, you know, to recognize it and learn from it. Um, so the good news is that there are things that we can do to make hearing criticism actually productive and learning from criticism actually like possible. And we're going to get there today. Uh, but first, I just want to acknowledge that um, negative feedback is really hard to hear. Uh, we all know this, but I'm going to tell a story just to bring it home. This is not a picture of the world's worst presentation. <laughs> this is a picture of me giving a, a, a workshop at um, Heartland Humane Society uh, when they were doing their rebrand, and it was actually a really fun time. But, um, but <laughs> there was another presentation, not pictured, where uh, I was working as part of a creative services team um, we were working with a very big, very cool client. Um, their name was Shadow Server. They described themselves like Batman for the internet. So this is the people, if you're the, the, uh, the, the country of the government of Germany and you are afraid that your security has been breached, you call Shadow Server and they, and they bail you out. Like, uh, <laughs> they, um, and also if you're an individual and you find that you've been blacklisted for some reason and you can't visit certain websites, like, you can call Shadow Server and they'll, they'll change that. Like, they, nobody knows about them, they're very active, they're, very, they're doing really good work out there in the world. Um, they're very cool. And they're extremely technical. Their work is very technical. I had been writing in the cybersecurity space for a number of years when I joined this project team. Um, so I had already been like a, you know, very familiar with just the cybersecurity world. And um, and they were they were talking like like leagues above my head. Like I was interviewing them and trying to capture all this information, and they were like t throwing out these terms. I couldn't keep up. I couldn't even be sure I was spelling things right. You know, like everything was very technical. It was really hard. And um, essentially, when we presented our first round of uh, branding work to them, it just bombed. Right? They um, they uh, they stopped and they stopped us really early in the presentation. They were like, "Wait a second, you're missing this. You're missing that." Why are you coming at it this way? You should be doing it that way. Um, they felt they kind of lost faith in us, uh, in our team, and that is just the worst. That's just the worst feeling, right? And it was 60 minutes of agony. Um, and to be fair, I think that there were things that we were recommending or telling that they were genuinely misunderstanding. That they, you know, some of their feedback was not actually um, completely on point. But a lot of it was because honestly, we had missed a lot of things, right? Um, so that critique was was not unfounded, and uh, it was it was mortifying, and it was the gift that kept on giving because it continued to be mortifying for like the you know the rest of the life of the project. We did bring that project home, and we did really good work. It was great, but um, but it was it was agony for, <laughs> for quite a lot of it um, on my end. Um, <coughs> So, you know, having told that story, I want to give you all an opportunity to think about a time when you felt attacked, when you felt personally deeply misunderstood, um, when you found yourself shutting down, when you, when you got defensive or maybe you uh, retaliated and went on the offense to try to protect yourself. Um, I want you to think of a specific time. I, you will not have to share that story today. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. But I want you to think about a specific moment. And I'm going to wait until everybody has a moment in their, um, in their life that they, can, that they can think of. So raise a hand when you, um, when you have a moment that comes to mind. All right, great. Um, so if you think about where your mind was at in that moment, how that moment felt, um, were you learning at your best? <laughs> were you feeling open and curious and, uh, you know, interested in finding solutions? Uh, probably not, right? The psychologist that I mentioned earlier in this presentation, Lauren, um, told a story about how uh, people who receive negative feedback 
learn significantly less from the experience than when they are receiving a confirmation that they got it right. And the study that sort of supports this conclusion is that uh, essentially there's a lot of participants, they're doing uh, a test, like a, like a school test, right? And they have these sort of um, either or questions. And uh, some of the questions you get right, some of the questions you get wrong. And, um, and the thing about getting a question wrong, if you get it wrong automatically, just rationally, you know that it was the other answer, right? You, you know which answer was right because you picked the wrong one. So theoretically, you should be able to say what the right answer was. But when they tested for comprehension, what they found was that people retained the learning from the questions they got right, and they did not remember what the correct answer was from the questions they got wrong. Um, because when you get the question wrong, you're not actually uh, open and learning, like you're not actually taking away a lesson. You're not like, oh, I, I got it wrong, it's the, actual, it's the other one, I'm gonna remember that. No, no, you're worried about how you feel. Uh, <laughs> you're worried about how you feel in that moment. And um, Lauren said uh, emphatically, it is almost impossible to overestimate the lengths that people will go to avoid feeling bad in the moment. Um, so, you know, the, the basically the idea is that pain, pain, being in pain limits our ability to learn. Um, all of those defensive feelings you get are there to provide armor and distraction to protect you from, from those bad feelings. The problem is that when you are armored up and when you're in that defensive mode, um, you're also protected from learning and growing. Um, now, is that really a problem? Why do we need to build resilience for negative feedback? Like, why can't we just kind of skate through life and sort of not, not deal with this? Um, I, I want to remind you of the, what, who I call the static mindset guy. <laughs> you know, the guy I mentioned at the beginning. Um, aren't you fine as you are? No. You're like, I mean, yeah, you're fine, but like, there's learning to do. It's, you know, it's, this is a part of life. We can't just opt out of this. And if we try to opt out of this, we, you know, it leads to disaster. So, yeah, we do, you know, this is an important thing to learn. Um, well, can't we just work on it on our own? You know, like in the privacy of our own little hearts and minds. Um, and uh, this is a tempting one for me. I'm, a, you know, a fairly private person in a lot of ways, and I like to, uh, I like to do my mess ups sort of, sort of uh, behind closed doors, <laughs> you know? I don't like to fail publicly. I'm probably alone in that. I'm probably alone in that. <laughs> really feeling but uh, you know um, but the, the trouble is with you know there are a lot of things that you can notice and you know if you're actively trying to be a, a good person a better person and improve all the time there's plenty of stuff you can always be working on right um, and that's valuable stuff but the trouble is um, we, we do have blind spots um, and outside growth uh, outside feedback is is pretty crucial to our ability to uh, to grow and improve um, remember that, you know, as Christians, we, we want to do good. We are striving to do good. As humans, we do need to improve. We, this needs to be a lifelong effort, right? And as, as a community, we can help each other. But only if we have the resilience to be able to receive that help and to make good of it, right? Um, research affirms that the knowledge of failure is a gift. Like, as with a, a you know, your blind spot, um, it fills in your blind spot. Um, it gives you information that you just can't, you just won't have access to otherwise. Um, if you go through life hearing only what's easy to hear, you're going to miss a lot, a lot of opportunities, right? Um, failure is information um, because trying again is not enough. If you are trying again and trying again and failing again and failing again, Maybe there's something wrong with what you're trying or how you're trying. And the, the, uh, the, the information that you're getting from those efforts not working out is actually navigational. You know, you can use that information to course correct and to try different, to try better. Um, again, to grow and improve. The, um, the psychologist Lauren said that uh, people systematically overestimate what they can learn from success, the easy kind of learning, 
and they systematically underestimate what they can learn from failure. There are huge opportunities that we can take advantage of um, if, you know, if we can bring ourselves to do this. Of course, all the reasons in the world are not enough. <laughs> Knowing that it's you know, a good thing is not enough to make us relish these opportunities. Uh, you know, and the truth is that we're not going to learn at our full potential as long as we're trying to avoid pain. And this brings us to dog training. Um, I am a uh, dog training hobbyist, and it's a major interest of mine. And I've, you know, spent way too many hours <laughs> reading about it online, and uh, watching videos, and reading books, and trying it out with my own dog. And um, essentially, you know, dog training boils down to there are basically two broad brush tools in the dog training toolkit. And one is aversives, that's anything your dog does not enjoy. So that might be withholding something from your dog that he wants, or uh, it might be, you know, doing something that he doesn't like, you know, smack the dog with the newspaper or whatever, uh, yell at the dog, you know, whatever. Um, so that's aversives. And then the other side of it is reinforcement, and that's anything that the dog finds enjoyable. So getting to play with the toy, uh, not having to come in right away, <laughs> you know, <laughs> getting petted or praised, getting treats. Um, so earlier I said that um, when people get feedback that they're correct, they're really tuning in and learning in a way that people are getting uh, failure feedback or not. That's really true of dogs. So um, when you have a dog that you're using a clicker to train, and the clicker is just a, um, a really easy way to clearly identify the specific moment when the dog has done the right thing. So you're training a sit, the dog's bottom touches the floor, click right then, right? So the dog knows it was that. That's the thing it was. Um, when you have trained the dog to seek that click, um, they become so joyful, so creative. They're trying to uh, crack the code. They're trying to figure out what it is that they need to do that's going to get that click. Um, and it's really fun for them. And they can learn to do amazing things. Um, so, um, you know, they, this is the other piece of it. They can even learn to, um, to do things that are at first really hard for them, or that even at first uh, they experience as being uncomfortable for them. Um, I think this is the next slide. Yes. So this is, this is essentially the idea, is that somehow we need to get to the point where we change our feelings around failure. Um, this is something that you can do in the dog training world when you have a reactive dog who, let's say uh, another dog comes walking down the street and this, you know, the dog just is so scared of other dogs that they start jumping or barking or like, you know, whatever, all, all kinds of bad behavior. Um, you can, um, using that positive training, you can get them to the point where they feel differently about the dog. They stop jumping around and barking and, and doing all the bad things, not because they have such self-control and they're, you know, they feel terrible that they're, you know, obediently walking by your side. No, no. Like, they get to the point where they actually feel differently about the dog that they're seeing. They're like, oh, that's a dog. I'm okay with that, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and this is a really powerful thing. This is a thing that we can also do uh, within ourselves as humans we can um, sort of change our associations, change the emotional landscape that we have attached to failure so that when we receive negative feedback or evidence of failure, um, instead of thinking, ouch, 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 that, this hurts, this hurts, I have, to, I have to protect, I have to hide. Instead of having that emotional reaction, we can learn to have this reaction of, um, oh, uh, this is that thing. This is that moment. I, there's actually something I can learn from here. Um, this is an opportunity. Ooh, this is, a, this is uncomfortable, but there's an opportunity here. Um, that's something that's possible, right? So we're going to talk about <laughs> perhaps how to begin on that journey. I have six suggestions. The first suggestion, first tip, <laughs> is to know that it's not an emergency and to claim your time. Okay, so if somebody comes to you with difficult feedback, um, you can take a beat. You can say, you know, if somebody even says, you, you wronged me, you harmed me, you, you know, you, you did this terrible thing, all you have to say is, 
thank you for telling me I'm going to think on this. I'm going to reflect on this. And then you can go home and you can have all those difficult feelings. You can think, oh, I can't believe they misunderstood me like that. I can't believe, oh, they're such a jerk. Or like, how could they have thought that I was that kind of person? I never meant to do them harm. All those things that come up, those defensive uh, sort of reactions, you can have that in the privacy of your own home <laughs> or your own journal or your conversation with your trusted friend. Um, and, and you can do that safely without causing any further, you know, escalating a conflict or something like that. Um, so, you, so this, essentially this gives you privacy and control. And that's really important for feeling, um, for, for having the safety to be able to, to listen, right? Um, and it also affirms you as the person in the driver's seat who's going to be taking ownership of this process. Because it's up to you to go home and reflect on that stuff and to think about it, and to find out what you can learn from it. That's your work. It belongs to you. And that, that's, that's affirming. That affirms your dignity and your responsibility, right? So, so yeah, first, beat, first, first tip, take a beat. <laughs> take the time you need to, um, to process and think, and, uh, and yeah, and everything else is better. Um, my second tip is, the, the Apostle Paul said, it is not I who sin. It is sin living in me. Um, if you're looking for a loophole or cop out here, you can you can find it in this one. You can say, "Oh, the devil made me do it." Oh, I'm a fallen. I'm just a fallen person. Of course, I mess up. You know, like you can you can use this to avoid taking responsibility if you want to. Um, you can uh, you can tell that person. You can take the beat and say, "Okay, well, I'm going to go home and think about this," and then not think about it, and just or like think about it and like have all your own feelings and reinforce all your pre-existing beliefs. You can do that. You know, um, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good to do that. Um, I'm assuming that we here don't want to do that. Um, and there's a lot, a much more powerful um, opportunity here rather than using this as a loophole. Um, what we can do is um, we can kind of create uh, safety and distance from our mistakes. You know, we separate our mistakes from, from our core identity, right? So going back to the research, that study that I talked about where the person was um, choosing uh, the answer A or answer B and either learning or not learning, whether they got it right or wrong, um, there is an exception to that rule um, so if you are sitting in the in the hot seat, right, and you're it's up to you to choose what is the answer to this question, is it A or is it B, and then you choose B and you're like, oh no, I got it wrong. You're not really learning from that, that A is the correct answer. But if there's a person standing behind you, watching you, or if you're standing over the shoulder of somebody who's in the hot seat, and you see them choose answer B, and then realize they got it wrong and that it was answer A, the observer uh, actually does retain the information. The observer um, in this study actually does learn from the mistake. And the brilliance of this uh, you know, uh, tip from the Apostle Paul <laughs> is that um, this allows you to be the person looking over your own shoulder, learning from that mistake. Because you're not on the chopping block. You're not on the line. Um, and so you are free to engage with the experience, right? So honestly, I think this is the most important tip of, of the, whole, the whole list. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's keep going. So um, my next tip is to really focus on where you're going. Um, it really helps to have a North Star. Uh, like I said before, the, the evidence of failure or of difficult feedback can be navigational. If you're trying to go north, and then somebody comes and taps your shoulder roughly and says, "What are you doing? You're going northwest. You're not. You're never going to get your destination." Like you can, you can, um, you can course correct. You'd be like, "Oh, hey, thanks. <laughs> I'm headed north. I'm gonna. This. I'm not a northwest kind of person. I'm gonna like move. You know, I'm gonna change. Um, I'm not trying to go there. I'm trying to go here." And you know this comes up in anti-racism work a lot. Um, uh, if you if you take the the evidence of failure as um, information to help you 
be better, to help you be more just, more equitable. You know, uh, like if somebody if somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, you know, I'm speaking as a white person, right, who is in invested in anti-racism work." If somebody comes to me, a person of color comes to me and says, "Hey, you've you've harmed me. You've done wrong." Or here's something that you're not aware of that you're maybe inadvertently perpetuating. Um, that's not an attack on me. That's the, like we both agree on the goal. Like the goal is anti-racism, right? And so, um, so that you know the 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 you know the impact of whatever that that mistake may be is very important. But the fact that I made a mistake is not actually that important. You know, like of course you want to handle the impact. You want to do right and make restitution or make, make repair, uh, how, whatever that may mean. But the the fact that you mess up is not actually it's not like a deal breaker. It's just like, oops, I tripped. Or like I've heard it described as like, hey, you have toilet paper on your shoe. That doesn't mean you're like the toilet paper guy. You know, <laughs> that just means you have something to clean up here. Um, and so you're you're lowering the stakes on failure. You're changing things from a capital F failure to micro failures. Um, uh, this comes up in creative services as well. You know, like when I'm uh, creating writing to deliver to a client. And they, uh, you know, it's very common in, in this space for people to say, no, it's not on target, you got it wrong, here's, how, here's all the ways your writing is imperfect. <laughs> and I learned a long time ago, I would not still be working in this space if I had not learned a long time ago to separate myself from the work. I honestly am not threatened when somebody says, oh, your writing sucks in this way or that way. You know, like, I, I, of course, I, I want to hear that it's great, but, like, <laughs> if it's not working, it's not working. It's not like, oh, your writing sucks, and therefore you're a bad writer, and, you know, you failed. It's, no, it's just, okay, well, there's something wrong with it, let's fix it, you know? Um, and so having that sense of where it's headed, having that sense that a mistake is not the end of the story, it's not the destination, I know what the destination is, having a sense that you're committed to values that are larger than yourself, that can help you reorient so that you can continue moving on that journey, right? Um, my fourth tip is that it's not static. You can focus on what you will do, right? Um, if you've done someone harm, you can ask, what do you need from me? If you, um, if you know something that you could do to try to make it right, you can take steps to try to make it right. Even if you haven't directly harmed someone else, um, if you've made some kind of mistake but you get so curious about the problem and the solution that you are, um, that, that your creativity gets involved and that your problem solving gets involved, you've taken it out of this personal shame and uh, like virtue, shame versus virtue space and you've moved it into this uh, more curious, more engaged problem solving space. Um, and that's really transformative. You become an active participant in your own learning. You take control of your process. Uh, if somebody comes to you and has a whole lot of feedback that you didn't ask for, <laughs> you know, they're like, here's a bunch of stuff that you're not doing right. Um, or here's a bunch of stuff that, I, like, places where I think you could, could improve. Um, you can do uh, what I've heard called, you know, chew up the meat and spit out the bones. Like, you can decide which piece of this is meat. This person's selling me a lot of stuff. I don't necessarily need to accept all of it. I can, I can make decisions, I can reflect on it, I can think about it, considering everything else I've known and experienced in my life, and I can see, okay, here's a piece of meat, I'm gonna integrate that one, and this one, I'm gonna call that a bone and I'm gonna spit that one out, you know? You can, you can take that as your prerogative, because if you're, if you're in the driver's seat and you're creating your own lesson from this feedback that you're receiving, then your ego is not threatened. You're not personally, you know, deeply threatened, you're, um, you're playing an active role. And again, this could be a real cop-out, like in order to do this, you, you have to believe, you have to be committed to the idea that there is something of value to be found. You know, like, I, I'm pretty resistant to, to feedback when I first hear it, I'm like, I, I probably know what's right, you know? And so when somebody comes to me and they're saying, here's where you got it wrong, my first impulse, and this is why I take a beat, <laughs> my first impulse is to be like, well, that's probably not true, you probably, you're probably gonna, you probably got it wrong here. Um, 
And again, this comes up all the time in creative services, you know, like, oh, your, your writing is not correct, it would be much stronger if you did it this way, and I think the, the suggestion is dumb. I'm like, well, that's a dumb suggestion, I think. You know, I don't say that, but I think it. And then, you know, and then I take a beat, and then I, and then I look for value, and I, I come back to it a day later, you know, a couple of days later, and I realize, oh, you know what, like, the client actually really does have a point here, and it actually would be stronger. Maybe not if I just did their um, suggested solution, their suggested improvement, maybe not that way, but here's a different way I could actually respond to their feedback and integrate it in a way that I think would be really strong and would really honor what, they're, what you know, the issue they're raising, right? So by focusing on what you can do and by putting yourself in that driver's seat of choosing what you are going to do, how you are going to honor that feedback, um, you can keep moving forward, right? Um, okay, tip five, it's not me, it's you. Sometimes people are jerks. <laughs> Sometimes people are unfair. Sometimes people say a lot of things without really having a clear understanding of, of who you are or what your needs are. Sometimes they are genuinely misunderstanding you. Um, sometimes they're speaking out of their own pain and their own anger. And sometimes it's helpful in those moments to recognize that uh, what you're hearing from this person might say more about them than it does about you. And again, this is not a permission slip to just disregard it all, right? This is just something to be aware of um, so that you can um, you can, you can take a pause and you can find a way to integrate, to find that value to integrate. Um, you know, it may be that some of the things that they're saying are not actually applicable to you, but that there's something in there. There is something in there that's worth finding. Um, there are plenty of times that people have said things to me that made me uncomfortable. There are plenty of times I've thought, well, that's unfair. Uh, there are plenty of thought, times I've thought, well, I'm not like that. Um, but somewhere along the way I realized, you know what, that's okay. Um, there, there is something here that, that they know that I don't, and it's worth it to, to figure out what that thing is, even if they're not delivering it perfectly, even if they're not saying it in the most diplomatic or, or, or gentle way, right? Even if they're kind of um, um, making their own mistakes in that moment, that's, that's okay, I can still learn from this, right? Um, even if it makes me uncomfortable, I can do this work to grow and learn. And if I mess up, like this is a big thing for me, um, like if, if I have actually messed up in a, in a significant way, that's actually okay. All I have to do is take responsibility for that. It's like if, you know, if, uh, <laughs> if I accidentally uh, drop a heavy thing on somebody's foot and they say, ah, and, I, and I'm like, Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, uh, and and I see. Oh, they need a band-aid, or they could use some neosporin. Like I can just run and get the band-aid and the neosporin. I can make it better. I can say, Hey, do you want me to bring you a glass of water? You know, like it's okay. It doesn't make me a terrible person. It just means that there's there's some work to do to try to to try to repair things. And um, and and it's not that bad to take responsibility for something you've done wrong. It's not actually a, a threat. It doesn't have to be a threatening. Thing to realize, oh, I did something wrong. Um, it's like, well, just just make it better then, <laughs> you know. Um, okay, tip six. It's not about shame. So much of this comes down to this uh, shame space, right? Uh, this is the thing we are so afraid of. Um, we we need to believe in our own value. We need to know deep down that we are worth it. Um, in order to learn. So I want to tell this story. My sister, uh, years and years ago, she was going to church, she was bringing her kids to church, and um, one day her daughter came out of church and, said, and uh, she was like, how was Sunday school? Oh, you know, well, I don't know, the Sunday school teacher told this story uh, about sin, <laughs> and the Sunday school teacher held up a bright, shiny copper penny, um, a beautiful bright penny, um, and said, this is, this is you, and then held up a smudged, dirty, ugly penny and said, this is, this is what sin does to you when you sin. And my sister was so mad that they had told that to her daughter. And she, and she said, 
to her daughter, okay, but tell me this, how much is that penny worth? That one cent penny is worth the exact same, whether it's beautiful and bright and shiny or whether it's smudged and ugly and dirty, right? Now, I mean, like, we don't have to sign on to the whole, like, do it making mistakes makes you smudged and ugly and dirty, but we can affirm the idea that even when you make mistakes, that doesn't change your worth, right? Um, interestingly, in the research, they found that the people who are most likely to be fine receiving negative feedback are um, experts in their field. Uh, if you are really well versed in your topic of expertise, and then you have a colleague or somebody come and say, oh, hey, actually, you're wrong about this one piece, um, you're more likely to feel grounded and to have the resilience to say, Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Oh, cool, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks for telling me that. Because you know your worth. That's not, it's not at stake, right? You, you, feel, you feel solid. And your value is not at risk. The times when you become threatened more often is when you lack that security to begin with. When your deep down fear is that you, you, they might be telling you that, that you're worthless and that they might be right. That's very scary, right? Um, when you feel that that negative feedback is a threat to you as a person, that's when your walls go up. Um, or if you are <laughs> receiving feedback in your area of expertise, if that feedback is so fundamental that it threatens to undermine your, your entire uh, grasp of the subject, then you might also become uh, defensive. And the story I'll tell for that is uh, they're in the world of archaeology. I'm sure you've heard the, uh, the narrative that, you know, how did humans first come to uh, the Americas and how did they do it? They came across the Bering Strait during, you know, when, during the um, last ice age when, the, when it was land, there was a land bridge and then they came down through Canada, they came through this ice-free corridor between these two glaciers and then they came and they populated the Americas super fast, yeah, um, like within 500 years, all of that land. Um, so this has been debunked. <laughs> this is not anymore the scholarly opinion on how the uh, Americas were populated. Now there's there's much there's a huge amount of evidence that says long before those that ice tree corridor opened, long before it would have been possible to walk through it, um, people were already here and they were already coming along the coasts. They were already they're already here, right? Um, now there's a guy who built his life work on. Um, on the first story, which is called the Clovis first model. Clovis was a particular culture that they found evidence of. And the idea for a long time has been Clovis first. Clovis was here first. The people who built the Clovis culture, they were here. And uh, he, like, it is very entertaining to me to read the, um, the scholarly papers wherein he submits rebuttals <laughs> to the uh, coastal migration theory scholars, and he's like, no, it wasn't like that. And then the coastal migration scholars will come and submit a rebuttal to the rebuttal, and it's like this like slow motion rap battle. <laughs> and, uh, and but it's also kind of it's it, you know it's it's really understandable, and I have empathy for this guy because he he spent his life's work uh, working on Clovis. You know, working on this theory, putting forth this theory that Clovis was first. And what do you do when you've like defined your whole expertise in terms of this? Well, what you can do is you can remind yourself of what you do know. Like the work that this guy did on Clovis is not all out the door, right? Like there's a lot of stuff that he studied and that he knows. Just because his his theory is not right doesn't mean that his life's work has no value or they ha he hasn't you know. Uh, <laughs> developed, like generated knowledge on this topic, right? That's still good. So you can remind yourself of what you do know. You can affirm the value of those things. And even if you, you know, even if you are being criticized for something where you really never have experienced success, all of that trying, all of that trial and error um, adds up to a lot of learning, even if it hasn't added up to success. And this was something that Lauren, the psychologist said, it, it adds up to a lot of learning. Um, and that's, that's, there's value in that, right? So we can affirm that value. Um, the main message that I want to leave you with is that the key to constructive criticism is safety. The key to listening and learning from this stuff is, safe, uh, is, is safety. And when I talk about safety, I want to be clear that what I'm not talking about is comfort. And this, again, is something that you come up against in the anti-racism space is, you know, people are like, wait, you know, 
there's this whole thing about white fragility. There's this whole thing about like you know wait. So I, I have to make you comfortable in order for you to listen to me and my experiences. Like I have to kind of like tiptoe around your your feelings. Like that's not really that's that's not what we're talking about. Um, growth is not comfortable. When you're in that zone where you are like learning something that you aren't already familiar with, but it's not so hard that you're you know completely lost. When you're in that in between zone that like every teacher knows about, right? Where you're like you're working hard and you're um, and you're and you're actually experiencing challenge. Like that's not a comfortable space. Um, safety and comfort are two different things. Um, safety is a necessity for learning. Um, and safety is, I would say, a human right. Like every every human deserves to be fundamentally safe, um, not at risk, not not in danger of uh, disaster or <laughs> you know, like uh, like ruination, right? Um, that said, safety in this context is something that we have a personal responsibility to cultivate. This little kid who's going out on her scooter to uh, you know get some uh, Pavement burns, <laughs> you know, the, she, like, she's not banking on the pavement being, like, soft, you know, soft mattress. Like, she, like, she's probably going to get some scraped knees, she's going to get some scraped elbows, but she's got her helmet, you know, <laughs> if those scraped knees are too much to deal with, she could put on her, uh, her knee guards, she could put on some shin guards, she could learn to ride that scooter. Um, <laughs> and this is the thing that we need to do, is we need to cultivate the capacity, the internal skills, the internal resilience, the tools to um, to become uh, to, to sort of cultivate our own internal safety, so that when negative feedback comes to us, when we find out we've messed up or caused harm, or that we could be doing something better, um, we don't we don't know when that feedback is going to come. But when it does come, um, if we've cultivated these tools, then we'll be able to find value in that feedback. We'll be able to, to learn and grow. Um, if we can find that stable footing, then we'll be able to listen, and we'll be able to integrate, and we'll be able to change. And that's that's really important. <laughs> so that's uh, that's the whole of it. <laughs> Do we want to talk about questions and answer or questions and comments? Yeah. Well, it goes both ways, of course. Sure. You, when you're when you are trying to help somebody learn, mm -hmm. um, you, you you we have to be aware that that if the person is scared, mm -hmm. they're not going to learn. Absolutely. And they're, they're going to be it's it's yeah. So it's not just our own learning, but yeah. like, as we as we reach out to others or as we're trying to be gently convincing, whether it's our spouse or whether it's uh, you know somebody you're having a disagreement with of any sort. Absolutely, and I, I feel that that's a really important responsibility. So uh, again, like um, Glenn and I have done some work in the anti-racism space with collaborators developing uh, workshops in for um, people in the business world to be able to recognize and confront sort of implicit bias and uh, and, and some of those privilege related things, and it it has become like a. Uh, just like a moral truth in my mind that when you're doing that, like, yeah, the goal is not comfort, right? Like, you, you are challenging people, but you do have to make them safe. You have to. Otherwise, um, otherwise it, it's not going to work. You know, people are going to fight. They're going to um, shut down. They're going to, uh, you know, and whether, whether or not you want to say, like, well, they shouldn't, they should learn. Well, yeah. But should doesn't go very far. And like our, our one of our family mottos is, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? And and in order to be effective in, you know, if you are delivering, if you are in the shoes of somebody delivering feedback, it's not your job to, to make them comfortable, it's not your job to pussyfoot around their, you know, their feelings necessarily. But you I think you should be, even if even if only for the sake of like strategic success in that communication, you should be thinking about their, um, like, you know, is there is there dignity on the line here? Uh, how, where is the space where we can where where actually change can happen here? And and you know, there's no there's it's complex and there's no single rule that's gonna that's gonna make it right for everybody. But I but I do agree with you wholeheartedly that that whether you are receiving safety if you're if you're receiving criticism you need to be um, 
taking responsibility for your own safety. And when you are giving criticism, you need to be at least aware of the other person's safety. So, yeah. I was thinking of Sheldon's sermon after that frightening quote from Amos. And I, I thought when I heard it that, uh, you know, the righteous was rolled down. Um, that it, it would come from elsewhere. But Sheldon got up and said, this is how people have acted. They actually got better when they faced their fears. Mm. And uh, as a result, uh, I, I honestly felt safer. Mm. And, um, and more ready to a, a accept Frankly, the news is usually terrible, mm -hmm. and that's hard to live with. Mm -hmm. And it is pretty darn threatening. It makes me just want to close it out. Yeah. Sometimes we say to each other, my wife and I, well, do we really want to listen to the news again? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, so it was particularly interesting to make that connection actually this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw Bill and then Craig. Well, could you elaborate on safety? I mean, there's personal, physical yeah. safety, you know, but I mean, if, like people don't, people don't like to give presentations, I guess. It's like the number one fear is, is public feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, you're probably not going to get attacked or shot at or whatever. You might get tomatoes. Yeah, so is it, is it safe <laughs> to do that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean what, is, what is the safety of beyond... You know, somebody has an idea that, mm -hmm. you know, about something and you challenge them on it. Yeah. And they say, well, you're, they didn't feel safe <laughs> now. Yeah. And now you're an attacker because yeah. you brought. I mean, there's there's a lot of opportunities for people to be unfair to each other. That's, you know, I, and uh, th there's no, there's no rule that's going to prevent people from being unfair to one another, whether they're on the listening side or the receiving side. You know, like you could, you could take this in the wrong way and be like, well, because it's your responsibility to, to uh, you know, c cultivate your own safety. I can say whatever I want to you and you have to, you know, deal with it. Or you could say, um, well, you didn't make me feel safe and so I don't, you know, I don't have to listen to anything you said. You know, like, the, both the listener and the speaker have opportunities to find loopholes and cop-outs here. But to sort of get it, the, what I think is the essence of your question of, like, the, the difference between risk and safety, like, I think we, we do take risks. Like, when we um, put ourselves out there, we, we, do, we do take risks. And, and that's fine. That's a part of it, right? Um, but uh, but that, that um, I'll put it back in terms of the dog training. That there's something, we talked about this earlier, too, in the earlier um, uh, session. But there's something, like, uh, there's something that the... Um, scientists call the seeking circuit. And what they're talking about is when animals are, you know, like including ourselves as human animals, when our seeking circuit is turned on, we're like, we're engaged, we're trying to figure it out, um, and we're having, usually usually interested if not having fun, right? And, um, and when you have the, uh, like that positive uh, clicker training that you're doing with the dog, you can get that, the, you can um, sort of encourage the dog to enter this mental space where they are having a great time trying to solve the puzzle. Um, and they are actually willing to take risks or experience discomfort uh, in order to solve the puzzle. So this, this trainer, um, I told this story earlier, this trainer said, you know, a lot of times if you go over to somebody's house and you bring your dog and they, you know, they go into the backyard, they'll like, you know, walk around, sniff things and, you know, just do their own stuff. She's like, when I bring my dog to an unfamiliar space, they start to work the yard. So they start to look around, and they're like, what does you want me to do, boss? Do you want me to run around the bush? Do you want me to jump over the bush? Do you want me to lie down? Do you want me to sit up? You know, like the dog is, it's seeking circuit is fully on, because they're like, we're here, we're probably here for a reason, I'm gonna do a job. And they, you know, and, and when, that, when that circuit is uh, engaged, that's when we're doing our best learning, that's when we're bringing our full creativity, that's when we're most interested. And when that circuit is not engaged, that's when we're shut down. We've gone into this 
Uh, like if you are telling the dog, no, not the bush, and you, you know, yell at him or you swat him with the newspaper, the dog will probably stop taking risks, stop putting itself out there, stop trying so hard, because it's worried about failure. It's worried about not getting it right. And I think that like, these things are all sort of tangled up when it comes to safety versus comfort and how does risk play into this, that it's like um, when you're in that active, forward-leaning, gotta figure it out kind of mode, um, you, you are able to go there because you know that you're safe. Because you know you're not going to get swatted if you do it wrong. If you've ever had a dance class where you're like getting the steps wrong, if your professor's like, no, not professor, your dance teacher's like, no, don't do those steps, those are the wrong steps. You might not feel so willing to, to try again, you know, because you're afraid of this, uh, of this sort of like punishing feedback, right? Um, but if you try and you get it wrong, um, uh, and that's not commented on, or like, you're, you know, we're just focusing on how to move forward in the, in the, in the toward the thing that you want, then, um, then you're going to be more likely to stay engaged and, and seek. I don't know if this is really answering your question entirely, but that's <laughs> what comes back. Um, let's, we can follow up, but let's hear Craig and then... Um, yeah, the, the safety thing and knowing someone else's safety, yeah. the, the experience I had was with my tennis partner in the last 10 years, um, who, who knows I attend church, he attends church, and he's actually become a pastor with no theological education nor biblical training, and in my opinion, is shockingly biblical, biblically illiterate. But what I found out so that we could have constructive conversations was what was at stake for him. Yeah. And that was how I asked, what's at stake? Yeah. And when I realized what was at stake, how he's constructed his worldview and you know what could be viewed as yeah. threatening to that, I was able to calibrate to, okay, what what can we share yeah. that, that is not going to be threatening to your yeah. foundation? I think that's actually a better answer to what you asked because if if your person is at stake, if your dignity, if your, uh, you know, life. obviously like life and limb physically, but also if your uh, moral, uh, you know, um, I don't know, well-being is on the line, then that is, you are not essentially safe. You're, you, you're not operating from a place of safety. Um, and, and it sounds like you're doing a lot of careful work to make sure that you are engaging with your friend and, and challenging them without putting their yeah and preserving you know the yeah. friendship and yeah sure sure mm -hmm. um, you had a thought? so I was really enjoying thinking about safety mm -hmm. in the agency that that's mm -hmm. that that implies yeah. versus um, when I take things wrong especially among loved ones I, I always reflect on I know they really didn't mean me harm yeah. but I actually wasn't trusting that I take it I start with I'll go, I need to trust more. That's actually where I often sit. Mm -hmm. And I've been saying that for years, but in some fundamental moments, it doesn't still get there. Yeah. But to say to myself, I need to create a safe zone. I need to be sure I'm safe. Mm -hmm. That gives me a lot more agency versus sitting there deciding if I trust or not. Yeah. And so somehow yeah. it's really pretty fundamental to say, create safety. It might mean I'm not going to be able to hear you if you shout. Yeah. <laughs> it might be that I ask something of that other person or not, but it's going to start with asking something of me, yeah. other than sitting there judging trust or not, which yeah. was my word. So I'm thinking there's just a lot more agency there to work with. That gives me something to work on to say, what will help me feel safe here mm -hmm. so that I can hear yeah. what my husband just said to me or whatever. It or I think that's, that's really right on. And I'm like a lot of the... the like one of the themes that's running through all six of these steps is really personal agency of like when you when you acknowledge your own agency in the interaction because a lot of times if you feel like a dog that's getting swatted with a newspaper or you feel like a kid that's getting scolded with a wagging finger there's a part of you that just kind of wants to curl up and go into a corner and um, and if you can sort of re-envision yourself not as the you know scolded corner sitter <laughs> but as a person who is who actually has choice in the matter and and has responsibility uh, to make choice, 
then that that is in, inherently even by accepting that responsibility, that's that's inherently affirming, right? right. right. Um, and um, there's another thing you said too about like I might. I may not be able to listen to you if you shout. I think that boundaries are really important here too. And to, to recognize your needs and to say, like, hey, I, I want to hear what you have to say, but I need you to speak to me in a calm manner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like, I, I just need a minute. You know, I think that like taking the beat is, is often uh, a, really, a really great right, fallback. Right, and the other thing throughout this day I've been thinking a lot is, as your um, important message about we are not our mistake, mm -hmm. right? But we all, but the other half of that is we're also not our success, yeah. right? You know, we have to be feeling good about ourselves. Yeah. That we've done things well, we've done our best, mm -hmm. and it, when it's a great success, we can't get too invested in that anymore than when it yeah. we fall on our face. It, yeah. it demands both. I think that's good, and that, you know, probably if the Clovis archeologist had uh, maybe uh, been clearer on that he was not a success yes. either, yes. maybe he would not have felt quite so threatened <coughs> that his work was changed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other, we're, I know we're out of time, but any other thoughts or questions before? Yeah. We all have experiences where um, we, in one environment, we really don't want to do something, but if you're in a different, slightly different environment, you want to. Um, every, you know, I went on a run this morning, and I had certain goals, and and um, it, you know, you train yourself that that pain is actually helpful, mm -hmm. and, and you get into sort of the zone of hey, I can take it, I can take it because this is this is good stuff, and yeah. I'm in my groove or whatever. Um, and then you say, yeah, but I don't like to do that when I'm writing something, or you know. Mm -hmm. And for us to for us to use these tips to to you know essentially trick ourselves mm -hmm. or to change. To change how we feel. That's who, is, is that what this is about? Yeah, like Changing to shift the meaning, to shift what it means. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, and it's a really good example of like running, you know, when you're burning up a hill, you know, like that is not a pleasant experience. I say as a lifelong runner who actually doesn't enjoy running that much. <laughs> like it's a very unpleasant experience. But if it, what it means to you is I'm getting stronger and building muscle and Improving and going to be faster, you know, like that. That that could even become an enjoyable sensation because you're like, when I get that sensation, that's when it's really happening. And and I think that that feeling of like when somebody's coming to you with feedback, we can make it mean that to us of like, oh hey, I'm getting some negative feedback. Like now we're grooving. Like like <laughs> let's see where this is going to go. Let's see what we can learn from this. You know. Oh, thank you. My last question is uh, the middle top. <laughs> yeah. An unsafe retreat. I, I'm just dying to know what is this like a periodical? It's a series of uh, mistakes will happen. I found these in the public domain on Wikimedia Commons. It's a series oh of um, like novels okay, that were novel. written, like maybe dime novels or something. Okay. That's like yeah, yeah, some of the examples are funny, like. Be, be careful, ladies. What the rat? The rat. 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 The rat.